objectively bad art. Does it exist? If objectivity does exist, does it fuck? There are stupid people on this hell site that do shitty art criticism that comprise of them shitting all over something that they don't particularly like and acting really smug and off the cuff about it and then at the end of the video they go, this is objectively bad. My opinion is the objective truth. There's also people on this hell site who think that objectivity in art is being corroded by the left and we're gonna come destroy the nature of beauty and truth itself with personas and they them pronouns. And if you're watching this and you believe that, it's true, we're coming for you. But I am not interested in explaining to you why Cinema Sins is lazy and stupid. You know that. And I'm not interested in debating art critics that I don't respect in the first place due to their lack of media literacy. You see, most of the creators that I actually respect have made videos on this topic heavily skewing towards the take that art is all subjective, which ultimately is true and is by far the most defensible stance to take philosophically when discussing art. But I'm going to agree with them while simultaneously reasserting the value of measuring quality in art. And not with number ratings or moral panic about postmodernism. I don't care about that. What I care about is the beauty and endless potential of art. I care about deep our appreciation, enriching our conversation, and expanding our minds. So as we enter this web of philosophy, consider the following. Some things are true, but not useful. Yes, art is subjective. Every single judgment we make is inherently tainted by our biases, and we're always living in the shade of our cultural conditioning, and it's hotly contested in philosophy if anything exists at all, let alone whether or not The Last Jedi is objectively bad, whatever the fuck that means. However, in ethical philosophy, just because we'll never settle on fundamental immutable truths of what's morally good or bad, it doesn't mean it's worthless to strive towards what is right. The quest for good in morality and art is inherently valuable, even if we're never gonna actually get the thing that we're chasing after. So for someone like me, deeply infatuated with art and craft and the meaning generated by such things, I'm gonna continue to pursue quality, even if I live in a simulation. It is big brain stuff. So I'm going to argue a very nuanced pro-objectivity stance in regards to art, it's based in sociology and philosophy and usefulness more than anything else. Again, lots of very brilliant creators have done videos on subjectivity in art, and I actually think that's probably the logical conclusion to these lines of thought. Think of subjectivity as our emergency exit button that it opens a trap door and it drops us out of our objectivity conversation right back into all of our biases and the inevitability of interpretation and we just keep this exit trap door button on hand so as soon as our tools of objectivity hold us back rather than enable us to do more we just in other words we engage with a collective value judgment of art while simultaneously admitting that our judgments are fallible. Just because a train of thought is falsifiable doesn't make it meaningless. Yes, walking bag of neurons hallucinating the time-space continuum, but even though my dreams feel real, I keep waking up in this reality, so I'm gonna treat it like it's real because it functionally is. Are you following me, fellow bag of synapses? How are you doing back there, behind the fourth wall anyways? Are you okay? You, you want a snack or a juice box? You want to fist fight me on the moon for the soul of humanity? You want to instate yourself as the dictator of a sovereign nation while you're floating on an air mattress in the middle of the Pacific Ocean repeatedly doing DMT? Are you excited to drink from my well of content? Leave a comment if you're excited to drink from my well of content, or if you want to do that air mattress DMT thing. Part one, the language of art. Art is defined by the multiplicity of values it provides. It does several things for us, trying to say specifically what is futile. Common values include emotional or intellectual stimulation, education, escapism, aesthetic beauty. I can't list them all, that's the point. Art is a massive umbrella term with a malleable definition and purpose, and people are always fighting about what's even under the umbrella. However, didn't we just list some of the utilities of art? This gives us a starting point to assess the usefulness of different works without having an impossible supreme measure of quality. Trying to nail down a universal objective measure for art quality naturally defies the nature of art as a shifting sand of creation and interpretation, but it doesn't mean we're just swimming in a marsh of complete subjectivity. It's not all just opinions and feelings people are throwing at things off their intuition. They're claiming something is useful or not based off of a value system. So when people dislike a piece of art and then they say that it's bad, they're saying it's it's not useful or it fulfills a value that is undesirable, like boredom or annoyance. And people do often come to consensus on whether or not something is useful and by what value system it is. We can agree on what something does and how it does it. If you look at the Wikipedia page for any mass critically acclaimed piece of art, they're gonna list specifically what it's known for doing. We can track pieces of art that are influential in the ongoing canon. But you may ask yourself, is consensus intrinsically valuable? Does 1,000 people thinking that a thing is good matter more than one person that thinks it sucks ass? Well, single dissenter, 
you're valid. However, mass consensus on something's quality does have a tangible effect beyond just the potential natural goodness of democracy. It has a feedback loop where consensus creates convention and convention becomes the language that we speak in. The shared language that we develop in any given medium becomes synonymous with technique and then there's rules that can either be followed or rejected but it absolutely objectively exists. This is what we study when we go to improve our craft. The language of art. Our collective imagination is a factually existing thing that affects us. The language of mediums has seeped into our minds as creators and audiences. There are historical precedents that have been set and are understood, and elaborating on those techniques will be recognized in context. We have history to draw upon to improve our media literacy, a history we'd be foolish to entirely reject out of hand. However, this brings us to a quote that I love from musician and video essayist Patricia Taxon. The act of establishing a rule or convention in regards to art or artistic practice will necessarily result in the implicit form of an equal and opposite anti-convention. Which is very true. As soon as you make a rule about what makes art good, then the disobedience of that rule now has meaning. And art is all about conveying meaning, so it's still arting. I don't think this is a blemish on our objectivity conversation in regards to art language. I think it's a natural exponential expansion of our dialogue. Every time we figure out how to say something, we also get the nega phraseology. As a result, we just have more ways to communicate. Okay. How we doing? Let, 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 let me summarize what I have just said thusly. Although art is subjective and dependent on our perception and interpretation, masses of people do come to consensus on if something is useful and generating a value and what that value is. When art is created and appreciated on a wide scale, it influences our media literacy. Our culture creates a common language, in other words, convention. And convention can be followed or rejected, but either way, it's part of the conversation. Your art does not exist in a vacuum. So I posit our art language is an objective way to evaluate art. Not by giving it a fucking number rating or whatever, but evaluating what it says and how it says it. We check its technique against that of histories. How does it use and elaborate on convention? How does it reject it? Is it useful in generating a value? What value is that? Huzzah! Objectivity. Part two, what we mean when we say it's bad. Simon Frith is a British socio-musicologist who wrote a fascinating paper called Bad Music. He demonstrates two primary categories of bad music, the production argument and the effect argument. In other words, it's stupid music and evil music. I think these two categories can be abstracted to describe our larger cultural vocabulary when it comes to media literacy. And so we're gonna go through the two of them and we're gonna see how insanely familiar this is. Bad type one, it's bad because it's wrong. We find it really difficult to say that a piece of art is bad without also saying that it's bad for society. Our lines between artistic judgment and social condemnation are pathologically blurred. For example, take our glorious, violent, vitriolic hatred for teenage women and anything they like. Girls like Twilight and they are stupid with small brain because they like tea parties instead of football. And we didn't just say that Twilight was bad. We said it was ruining literature. The art is making us stupider. People who don't deserve it are profiting off of us. It's desecrating the dignity of the medium. Your hatred for a thing that teenage girls are super into is so unoriginal that it's a finable offense. Two of my other favorite examples, of course, are The Last Jedi and The Last of Us Part Two. A lot of people had issues with those things, but I don't hear those issues. I hear that people are bad. The Last Jedi ruined Star Wars because the Hollywood elite liberals didn't understand what Star Wars was for. They destroyed the legendary character of Luke and they disrespected the fans. Ryan Johnson was being way overindulgent and subverting expectations just for the sake of doing so. The Last of Us Part Two is a direct fuck you towards the people who love the first game. Laura Bailey and Neil Druckmann actively hate their fans. This is not critique of the media. This is hatred towards real human beings. The offense isn't that the art is objectively bad. It's that people did bad things to me. <laughs> As Frith puts it, bad music, it seems, is responsible for bad things. It is Frith, right? Not Firth. I, I had to remember that. Oh my god, I didn't put it in my bibliography. I, I checked, it is Simon Frith. So what makes the last properties so offensive to these people? It's not unconventional story structure and it's not new directions for the characters. They don't cite shitty cinematography or bad dialogue or a lack of thematic coherence. They don't want to engage on that level. It's about their beloved characters, about how these texts are reading to them like a fuck you. It's bad people with their social agendas and their overindulgent attitudes and they're taking over things and they're destroying things we love. If this is celebrated and allowed, more things like this could occur. If other people like this, 
more important things are gonna become perverted. After all, why do we look down upon things that copy other things? Like why is it an insult to call something derivative? Because we perceive it as a moral wrong to not do your own work. So if you plagiarize, even if the result is of good quality, it's bad because it's bad for society. It's stealing. The art isn't just bad, it's bad. Bad type two is the production argument. It's bad because it's stupid. What is art for? That's a massive question that we're not gonna be able to answer today. Or will we? I'm, I'm pretty good at this. A massive swath of the population can agree that art is inherently communicative. We make art to share it. We imbue it with ideas and we try to get those ideas across to other people. The Last of Us 2 was made for people to play. The Last Jedi was made for people to watch. Twilight was made for people to read. I make these videos and I try to be funny. I do it on purpose. I know it seems so natural. I want to entertain you. But what is entertainment? What, 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 what? Let's be nuanced and civilized and beautiful in creating a definition for this. Most of us would say entertainment is what generates fun, but fun is a slippery ass word. I guarantee a lot of people who hated The Last Jedi love Requiem for a Dream, but Requiem is not more fun. Way back in ancient Greece, really sexy boys like Aristotle were already mapping out how we can ca categorize entertainment that isn't necessarily giving us positive emotions as still a positive experience. This is the concept of Greek catharsis, where we can vicariously safely experience extreme emotions and and have it enrich ourselves. While we're in ancient Greece, we can also talk about hedonism, an ethical theory of pleasure good, misery bad. But of course, pleasure does not necessarily mean infinite orgasm, ice cream, MDMA popcorn. There are attitudinal pleasures that are also important, like peace, self-knowledge, self-actualization, meaning, connection, intimacy, basically my relationship with Benji from Yoga with Adrian. This brings us back to the usefulness of art. We come to art for fun, for escapism, for shows of craft to see ourselves reflected on the screen. We come for surprise, for life lessons for Greek catharsis. So when we don't like art, but we're not sliding into moral condemnation, there's something we want that we're not getting. What do people want from music? What is it they're not getting when they describe a song or performance or work as bad music? You seem angry. What did you expect? What did you want that you didn't get? Out of curiosity, is there maybe something else that the media does that you weren't looking for? Did it perhaps just not aspire to reach your expectations? When art does not satisfy a value that you hold dear, then it becomes stupid. It's reaching beneath our standards. The experience is insulting to the senses. Think of when people describe Bojack Horseman as just the writers jerking themselves off, or Aaron Sorkin writes all the characters like they are Aaron Sorkin, or that super novel opinion you have that Jacob Collier is all technique, no feeling. <laughs> When people say that Tenet was overly complicated just for the sake of being so with nothing human to grab onto, they're saying Christopher Nolan was too indulgent. The artists didn't respect the core principle that art is communicative. They were supposed to let us in on it. They were supposed to satisfy our need for comfort and immersion. So this is the second type of bad. Stupid shit that wastes my time. Part three, bad art. Did you see that the sun set? While I was filming? Were you wondering if I was gonna point it out? I just needed to finish part two. Okay, but like, yeah, part three bad art. Get ready for the real galaxy brain shit. Why are the effect argument and the production argument necessary in the first place? Why do we need to go out of our way to articulate that media is bad? If you see something and you're like, this is stupid, I hate it, why talk about it? If you see something morally reprehensible, why would you spend your time inside of it? Just leave it alone to die. It sucks, it's gross, and I hate it. But that is not human nature. When we see something that is bad, we feel a deep need to express its badness. Bad art is a cultural concept created the moment that we experience something and we don't like it. Then after the fact, we go out of our way to justify it. Bad art is our need to express that we don't like something. And we have two ways we can express our distaste. We have our effect argument and our production argument. Moral outcry, this art will create bad things that I don't want to take hold. Stupidity, I came here for something and I got nothing. I just came out here to have a good time and honestly I'm feeling really personally attacked right now. But ultimately bad art is only useful insofar as articulating the badness. It's for us to proselytize that this thing sucks ass. And we wouldn't feel the need to articulate the uselessness of something unless there was a group of people that were advocating for its usefulness. Those people are deluded or malicious. We have to fix it. Which brings us to identity. We all make anti-capitalism jokes, but only some of us researched enough to actually break it down. You see, in our capitalist consumer society, our lives are separated into our work lives and our leisure lives. In our work lives, we are stifled in our terms of our identity. We, we have to conform to rules and just slave away so that we can get money to live. But our leisure time, it's our free time. This is where our freedom is. For all the time that is not work, we are blessed with the freedom to pick what we buy. Choose our entertainment. Leisure costs money. 
or at the very least, it doesn't generate it. And what we choose to do with our leisure is us choosing how we're exercising our freedom. And in this world of choice, all of our choices are indicative of who we are, who we want to be, who we aspire to be, and who we want to associate with us. I mean, I slave away making videos for you so I can pay for my gay little eyeshadow palettes and I put them on and it attracts femme people to me like ants to a sugar cube. I wear this every day, even though we're in lockdown. I wear it because it makes me feel like myself. I bought a pipe and I buy tasty tobacco so that in my free time, I can go burn that shit and kill myself. We have to articulate our taste to maintain our sense of self. Our identity is defined by our taste. So when we think art is bad, we feel a need to articulate that it does not represent us. Oof. Does this sound familiar to you? And this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Frith actually explains that Part of bad music is the fun of music. We get to select what connects to us and then what doesn't. This is part of musicking, as it were. And it's fun to mock shit with your friends, right? It's fun to dunk on bad art. I mean, that's obvious, isn't it? But you know what else is obvious? Part four, what if it's obvious? Is this... ...different than this? Is this... Different than this. Is it? It's just... I can't believe you committed suicide. I cannot believe you committed suicide. How could you have done this? How could you have committed suicide? Like, listen. If a large amount of us can agree that art is communicative, it's about catharsis and entertainment and intellectual and emotional stimulation and the conveying of ideas, what's wrong with proceeding forward with this knowledge? Isn't it clear that Queen's Gambit is good? Like, good. Are you seeing people that are going like, this thing sucks. It follows tried and tested aesthetic and technical rules and it is compelling as fuck. And don't you care what really experienced artists think is great art? Hell, I mean, the fact that you're watching this video means you're presuming that what I'm gonna say has value. I'm qualified somehow. But what if I reveal to you? I've never seen a Star Wars movie in my life and I don't play video games until, of course, I sat in a basement playing The Last of Us 2 with The Last Jedi playing on loop and then I came out and I was like, these movies are genius. Surely this would damage the validity of my critiques. What we're describing is something David Humes calls delicacy. Delicacy is what we're pretty sure Gordon Ramsay's mouth has. It's what everyone thinks they have, what everyone actually wants, but few truly possess. And it is acquired by practice and careful consideration. So advantageous is practice to the discernment of beauty that before we can give judgment of any work of importance, it will even be requisite that that very individual performance be more than once perused by us and be surveyed in different lights with attention and deliberation. Who in good conscience can disagree with Hume's assertion here that before we cast judgment on a piece of art, we should see it more than once and think about it. Jay-Z agrees. People are writing a review in a, in a day. First of all, you can't listen to a, an album and rate it in a day. It's just impossible. It's, yeah, it's, it's impossible to, to even get it. what every, and the nuances, the, the, all the instrumentation, all the words, what, what is being, you know, said in the music. Donkey agrees too. But why is my opinion more valid than this guy's? Well, first off, I actually completed the fucking game. So, yeah. Training your mind is good. I trust people who have spent a long time pondering or creating art to have better taste in art. I would even lean a little deeper into hedonism to suggest that their experience of pleasure when it comes to art might be a higher form of pleasure than we receive completely off of sentiment. And folks, do not forget about this button. The logic does not necessarily work out in favor of Hume and Jay-Z and video game Donkey and me. That's a, that's a group of people. Your waking consciousness is a hallucination. Your perception of art is completely cast in the shadow of your sentiments, senses, socialization. It's bias, 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 every direction. We just... <laughs> but, you, but you know what? <laughs> Not all of life is an abstracted exercise in philosophy of being and reality. <laughs> Our collective imagination of art is a communicative cultural quest for entertainment and value and meaning and exploring the ends of our emotions and intellects and it's building off of a thick history and a language to enrich our spiritual and cerebral elements of our very selves. So I don't look at Hume as a necessary stepping stone that we crush the face of so that we can get to the inevitable endpoint of nothing is real and God is trans, even though both of those things are true. You see, sub 
subjectivity and postmodernism are necessary tools to break down oppressive traditional structures and assumed things that are not necessarily true. It expands us. It can free us from elitism and limiting unnecessary rules that we readily accept. And it's important to respect some semblance of historically recognized greatness. There might be some value in our pre-existing cultural narratives. We might become stupider if we pretend everything ever has been bad, as leftists are very fond of doing. And this is where we encounter the inescapable sexual tension between me and Jordan B. Peterson. Part 4. The sexual tension between me and Jordan Peterson. It keeps getting darker, mom, I'm scared. In my Tangled video, I, as a joke, called myself a light side Jordan Peterson. Then the next day, the truth of it haunted me. You see, even though when I try to go near churches, they start pelting me with fire arrows, I actually am a Christian. Because I'm Christian, many of my values and worldviews are informed by Jesus Christ. And as a result, some of my religious and moral beliefs have a similar flavor to Peterson's. The guy was a teacher at the University of Toronto in my own city before his 2016 JK Rowling ass voluntary trans war enlistment. So dad didn't like the piece of legislation that was introduced in Canada that was trying to make misgendering people classified as hate speech. He didn't like it because it's totalitarian and it's changing the nature of our reality. It's subjectivity and communism coming to corrupt our taste. It's bad because it's stupid and it's bad because it's wrong. And so saying all that stuff that I just said, that's just his career now. Dad is rhetoric incarnate. He weaves together sociology, philosophy, ethics, history, art, religion, spirituality, all together so he can make a compelling message about greatness and purpose. It's, it's fucking me. The place that we differ is I do not harbor a Jewish question level conspiracy theory about how queer teenagers are coming to destroy everything with postmodern communism. Are you sure that that is, are you sure? Because that's fucking insane. This guy vexed me deeply. I like good speakers that weave together disparate concepts to find common truth. And in particular, I really like his takes on art and aspiration, mostly. And he maintains this plausible deniability by saying these really long sentences that obviously have like an oppressive implication at the end of them, but he never says it. He just allows us to infer. And then if anyone says it, he goes like, wow, wow. I don't, that's not what I'm saying. And I don't deign to have omnipotent knowledge of the inner workings of daddy's mind. But if you are not a sexist, white supremacist, transphobic, colonialist pundit, but all of your fans think you are, and they fucking love it, your intentions cease to be of significance. Which in a roundabout way brings us back to my point, pragmatism. It is subjective what you make of Jordan's intentions and philosophies and the, the directions they're supposed to take you. However, his impact is meaningful to discuss in objective terms. Consensus defines effect. So with all these caveats out of the way, I, the point is I, I want to show a Jordan Peterson clip in a positive light. So here it is. Because music is the one thing that modern people can't be cynical about. Thank God for that. And I've been fascinated by music because of that. It, it speaks meaning to people, right? Even nihilistic punk rockers are so damn engaged with their music that they can hardly stand it. And you can knock on them and say, look, you know, you're having a transcendent religious experience and they'll just tell you to fuck off because that's it. <laughs> you study literature in the humanities so that you can familiarize yourself with the wisdom of our civilization. Man, you should do that because people have been working on this thing for a long time and it's rich beyond comparison, so why wouldn't you do that? And you teach yourself to, to read and you teach yourself to speak and you teach yourself to think and you teach yourself to communicate. And I can tell you, if you can read and think and and communicate, you are absolutely 100% unstoppable. He's right. Like, fuck yeah. That, yes. And then the brain worms kick in, and then it's postmodern neo-Marxist conspiracy theories. I, I don't understand where he gets this. Postmodernism is a major movement in the art world because it's pushing us forward. Subjectivity is expanding and sharpening our artistic scope. And this doesn't interfere with how objective analysis can bring us to greater technical heights and eventually great spiritual experiences. And I, I, we're not trying to take that away from you, Dad. I know you love that. If you sit through a movie that is known as a classic and you don't fuck with it, is it not of value to you to seek out why it was acclaimed in the first place? You almost definitely missed something. <laughs> Who would not want to enrich their understanding of anything and potentially unlock the ability to love something as much as other people have loved? I mean, if I never sought experiences outside of my comfort zone, I'd still be 13 in the back of a school bus getting bullied while listening to I Got a Feeling on an iPod shuffle on repeat. This motivation to learn, to humble ourselves and refine our taste and dialogue concerning art 
This is a good thing. We want this. In the classic movie example, objectivity gets us there. In unconventional art, subjectivity does. Because objectivity is the driving force behind our greatest artistic achievements and it is our art language shared by the collective imagination of all of humanity, live and dead. But subjectivity isn't the end of that. It's just another tool that we use to dive deeper into the endless expanse. The objective, like the scientific, is a descriptive process where we create the theory after the fact. Reality happens and then we map out how it works. We can have all of our traditions and our histories and our cultural truths while simultaneously dismantling racial hierarchical patriarchy and destroying capitalist market worship. We can do both. And, and, and you know what? Jordan Peterson doesn't own Judeo-Christian values. I find this working definition of Judeo-Christian values in our discourse quite offensive because I let Jesus into my heart and he turned me into an anarcho-communist gender-confused ideologue that likes to say fuck. Part five. So does objectivity fuck? Yeah, no, I think objectivity fucks. Venturing into objective discussions about media with our art languages, I, I just feel like they ev 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 elevates our dialogue about media beyond just, in my opinion. If this channel has a goal, it's to elevate our media literacy because I am pro-joy. I get so much joy out of art and loving art is a, such a joyous experience and interacting with it can bring um, enlightenment. And I, there, there's deeper joy than you think there is. I'm not satisfied, viewer, with you just liking stuff. I want you to know why you like it. It doesn't end at sensory abstract pleasure. It can be intellectually fulfilling. This is what Daddy Peterson talks about when he refers to having religious experiences when you are caught up in artistic greatness. Like. It, it, I agree. How, with the language that we've established with our canon, can we articulate and justify the beauty that we intuitively understand? The more we articulate it, the more real it becomes. I'm not satisfied with people just loving their favorite pieces of art. I, I want them equipped and thoroughly intimate with the tools required to prove and perform their love. There's more to talk about here. I don't consider myself a critic. I, first and foremost, all the time a creator. I'm on the side of art, so I have no real interest in doing thing bad videos. However, philosophically, there is definitely bad art via impact. And I do totally feel like some art is stupid, bad, like, and if I did videos on it, I would get a fuck ton of views, I know. So I don't know, anyway, maybe I'll revisit this topic in the future and go harder and further using other philosophers. The research for this one really did my head in, like, do you guys ever, like, feel your brain working overdrive? Like, you're, you're trying to compute a wide array of abstract concepts and you're sourcing from across mediums and cultures and it, 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 just, it starts to like rattle like you can envision the gears like starting to spin and the sparking and the smoke coming out and you start to lose control of your own mind. I'm just drinking wine, eating salad, staring around like there's demons here. I'm trying to pull all this information together and get the best version of the truth out of it, something perhaps useful to the universe and I'm waiting for someone to come by and be like, this is good. You're good, but no one's coming. It's just me. I have to decide when it passes the threshold of shareability. No one's gonna give me the stamp of approval. I'm an adult now. I'm in charge of my own life and I'm gonna die alone. The sooner I realize it's all up to me, the better equipped I'm gonna be when I finally have to face the dark shadow of death. No one's coming with me into that void. Yeah, I didn't really ever know my dad. Probably why I'm so into Jordan Peterson. Tell me to clean my room again, Dad. I think I'm an addict, want the world and I'm a habit. I'm so fucking dramatic, got all my bones up in the attic and I dance them all around like a marionette. Still a new channel, so we're learning things every day. Like, don't shoot at sunset.